Today's talk is titled, Is Middle East Possible? Middle East Peace Possible? And it's one of two talks, <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, I suppose. <laughs> um, so is Middle East Peace Possible? And it's one of two talks that we will do to address this very, very important issue, um, looking both at the impediments and the opportunities for peace in the Middle East. Um, today, we will focus on border and security issues. The second part of the series will be on March 6th, and we will focus on the future of Jerusalem and refugees in that session. And today, to introduce our speakers, we're very lucky, lucky to have Deborah Amos. As most of you who listen to NPR know, Deborah Amos covers Middle East um, and, uh, for, the, for NPR. And, but we have the, we're very lucky to have her on Princeton's campus this semester. She is the Ferris Professor at the Princeton University's Council on the Humanities and is teaching a course on foreign correspondence and all things media. Uh, maybe she can explain that. Um, so she will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. And then afterwards, we are having a public reception in Schultz. So I hope you join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's like being at work, but I like work. Uh, this is a great topic, uh, and the fact that we have an overflow crowd tells you that most of you hope that it is possible. And we have two great gentlemen who are going to lead us through a discussion on whether peace in the Middle East is possible, and I am here to introduce the two of them. Just one housekeeping issue. Please turn off your cell phones. Thank you very much, and keep them off for the duration. Um, we are going to hear two presentations, and then I'm going to do uh, a little bit of an interview, and, and we're going to open it up to the floor. But let me tell you who we're going to hear from um, this evening. First, Ambassador Dan Kurtzer. Uh, he served from 2001 to 2005 at the, as the United States Ambassador to Israel, and from 1997 to 2001 as the United States Ambassador to Egypt. I could spend the rest of the evening completing his resume, um, but suffice it to say that that experience allows him to tell us a lot about whether Middle East peace is possible. I also want to introduce the Honorable Robert Wexler. Robert Wexler served as a Democratic member of Congress for seven terms, representing Florida's 19th district in the U.S. House of Representatives. He retired in 2010, but hardly retired. What he started to do was in some ways harder than what he'd been doing before as a congressman in Florida. He is now the president of the S. Daniel Abraham Center for Middle East Peace, and that is where he's developed some of the points that he's going to be uh, talking about in just a few minutes. During his tenure in Congress, he served as the chairman of the Subcommittee on Europe and the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and he was a member of the Middle East Subcommittee. Again, I could spend the rest of this talk uh, telling you his resume. But I think what we'd like to do is get to two presentations. And we're going to start with Ambassador Dan Kurtzer. He's going to lay the ground for, for how Middle East peace is working and how it's not. And then we're going to hear from uh, the Honorable Robert Wexler. And he's going to put in the details. And then we'll talk about it. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm actually the warm-up act for the main presentation uh, that Robert will give you in a few minutes. Uh, and it poses the question, as Deborah suggested, of whether peace is possible. Uh, many of you who have been here for earlier presentations on subjects related to the Middle East peace process, and uh, both I and other speakers have asserted as a certainty that peace is possible. What uh, Robert Wexler is going to try to do today, and also on March 5th, when he will come back in a second presentation focusing on uh, settlements and Jerusalem, is to ask the kinds of questions that policymakers will need to pose and to suggest ways in which those questions can actually be answered in a manner that can uh, move us toward uh, a peace process. Uh, in doing so, one of the uh, contextual problems that also needs to be resolved is whether or not a peace process becomes a priority for the United States and for the parties in the region. And this is a question that has particular salience these days, given the proliferation of problems that the United States and others have to deal with. The Arab Spring, for example, whether or not the United States can navigate its way through a traditional set of interests with a traditional set of allies 
but also find itself aligned with forces that are promoting democracy, a long-term national interest of the United States. The question of what happens in Iraq, stability after the withdrawal of American forces, the large question in the region of what are Iran's uh, ambitions. Uh, are they nuclear? Are they hegemonic? Can Iran find a way to live with the region? Can the region find a way to live with Iran? Uh, in dealing with Iran, do issues such as sanctions and diplomatic leverage work? Have we exhausted diplomacy? And what about the possibility of the use of force? A fourth issue in this region is what do you do about problematic non-state actors, Hezbollah and Hamas, for example, who not only have it within their capability of disrupting stability and the status quo, but have been the primary actors in almost all of the conflicts to take place in this region between Israel and Arabs since 1973. Uh, what do you do with this peace process that appears stalled? We're gonna to talk to you today about some of the substantive issues in that process, but there are also the politics of making this process attractive to the audiences in the Middle East, to the peoples most affected by the absence of peace. And what, what about the big power relationships involved? The United States is now a, a superpower turning uh, to the Pacific, with greater interest being manifest every day as uh, China's power is rising. Our relations with Russia, which we thought were reset, may be in the process of another resetting. How do those big power relationships both affect what we do in the Middle East, and how does the Middle East impact on the way in which these big powers uh, see their interests play out? We saw recently with respect to Russia and China, and we're gonna discuss it tomorrow uh, in some detail, the impact of a, an effort by the international community to bring about enhanced sanctions only to see those sanctions uh, vetoed by the Russians and the Chinese. The dilemmas for the United States and the constraints in this context of regional challenges are quite significant. First of all, as we know, we have an overloaded domestic agenda. Had we, have, had, we had no foreign policy problems at all, we would still have a president uh, engaged full time, over time, with the domestic, uh, social, economic, infrastructure and other challenges. You add on top of that these significant foreign policy challenges just in the Middle East, and you can see where the competition for the policymakers' time becomes a very important question. And we are in the middle now of a presidential election campaign. Things don't stop when presidents stand for re-election, and they certainly don't stop domestically, and they don't stop in the Middle East or elsewhere. And it becomes a dilemma of how you balance off the need to deal with these problems and these issues while you're also dealing with constituencies that have black and white views on these issues, not gray. And most policy areas, as you know from our discussions here on a range of subjects, fall into the gray area. What do you do about growing bipartisanship in this country over foreign policy? Uh, in a, a book that I co-authored a couple of years ago, we suggested that in an earlier period, just 20 years ago, Congress very often would give the president a great deal of latitude uh, to play out uh, his ambitions in the Middle East if Congress thought that the president's policy made sense. Congress doesn't do that anymore if the president is from a different party. And the partisanship that has infected all of our politics has now carried over into the foreign policy area as well. And finally, in this question of US dilemmas and capabilities, is the question of whether the United States is a shrinking power. We would all like to believe that that's not the case, but there is a debate among the political cognoscenti in this country as to whether or not we have the capability and the will to do what we used to do, which is to determine largely what are in our interests and then to pursue those interests aggressively. This, these issues, these challenges, these uh, complex of constraints and possibilities play themselves out fully with respect to the Middle East peace process, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Israelis and Palestinians remain headed in an opposite direction. This is not a period in which it's been easy even to bring the two sides to the negotiating table. President Obama has tried since coming into office at the beginning of 2009 
and only episodically has been able to bring the two sides to even sit together, let alone to bring substance to the table. The U.S. during this period has certainly been actively engaged, including with a high-level presidential envoy, but as you've heard in presentations here in the past months and years, the United States has seemed to lack a strategy. In other words, unclear about how to wrap our various interests in the peace process together in a strategy that makes sense. Pressing other priorities in the peace process itself. What do you do about Palestinian interests in expanding international recognition, in effecting reconciliation between the Palestine Liberation Organization and Hamas? How does that play into or contrast with the Middle East peace process and the search for peace? And as you've also heard here, you now have the beginning of what I called from this podium the Washington Consensus with respect to the peace process. It's too hard. Why don't we wait until it's more ripe for resolution? We can't want peace more than the parties themselves. In other words, a series of mantras that get played out among Washington policymakers that effectively combine to push policymakers away from the idea of moving on the Middle East peace process. What we're going to try to do today, and what Congressman Wexler is going to start to do with respect to the important issues of borders and security, is to suggest that it's not too hard, and that peace is possible, and that we can want peace at least as much as the parties themselves if we disaggregate and analyze carefully the way these issues intersect and the trade-offs that may be possible both within the respective issues but also between them. And so with that, as this warm-up act, if it's okay, Deborah, I'll just introduce yeah. Congressman Wexler. Congressman Wexler will now present the issue of borders and security. Thank you. Um, good, good evening. I'm, I'm Robert Wexler, and it's a privilege for me to have the opportunity to engage with you this evening. Uh, to my left is Svika Krieger, who is a colleague of mine. I want to thank Princeton for uh, allowing me this uh, opportunity, and it's a particular privilege for me to follow Ambassador Kurtzer, who I'm sure all of you are familiar, but from my vantage point, is one of America's finest patriots. Uh, having served both a Republican and in both Republican and Democratic administrations, uh, but above all, uh, served with a degree of honor and distinction and intellectual capability that is rarely found um, in in the diplomatic ranks uh, of our nation. He he truly does stand out. So it's an even greater privilege to describe what uh, we hope to do. Um, how many of you may may remember the? TV show Dragnet. Remember Dragnet? And it was Sergeant Friday, who I believe uh, started the show with just the facts, ma'am, or some, something like that. What we would like to do with respect to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which uh, we humbly say is unique because uh, this is a topic that, of course, has been written about, studied uh, ad nauseum. But what I don't think has been done is uh, presenting the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with a degree of uh, objective truth, understanding that we all have our own bias, and I am certainly not an exception, but what I'd like to think is that we painfully have brought to you a presentation that is as objective as is humanly possible, and rather than focusing on the exhaustive historical narrative and pain that uh, both sides bring to this equation, we have focused on what, in fact, are the bottom line positions of both the Israelis and the Palestinians with respect to what is ordinarily referred to as the four core issues, borders, security, Jerusalem, and refugees. And as has been stated previously tonight, we will talk about the first two, borders uh, and security. And we will present to you the bottom line positions of the Palestinians and the Israelis, and how, if at all, those bottom line positions can be bridged 
and what alternative solutions are there, and then actually you can decide if peace is possible and how we get there. Uh, so with that, This, of course, just puts ourselves in context where we are. And we start with the Palestinian approach. The historical position of the Palestinians, of course, is that all of what is referred to as Israel plus the West Bank and Gaza, that's ours, the Palestinians believe. To get a sense of how the Palestinian approach has evolved from the it's all ours 100%, you could see in 37, 38, the Peel Commission, in 47, and then in 67. But we focus on 67 because, in essence, when you boil down the Palestinian view with respect to borders, this is it. They've already made an enormous compromise, the Palestinians believe. They've gone from 100% of Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza to agreeing to accept 22% of that land. They've given up 78%. So the Palestinians will argue. And it follows then that any changes to the 67 lines from the Palestinian perspective is a compromise on top of an extraordinary compromise. So they believe and you will hear it in all different ways, that a Palestinian state must, in effect, comprise the equivalent of 100% of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and they will not accept an inch less. Now, the Israeli approach. Similar to the Palestinian approach, it's all ours. All of 67 Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and there are, in fact, Israelis that think it's more than that, part of Jordan the other side of the Jordan River, that's the maximalist position, of course. With respect to the 67 lines, the Israelis are quick to point out they were never intended to be a border. They were never recognized as a border. Israel won the territory in a defensive war. They didn't attack anyone. They were attacked by a numerous group of countries. And that they shouldn't be treated, the 67 lines, as some sacrosanct wholly given set of circumstances. What do the Israelis say are important? If the 67 lines are not so important, what is? To the Israelis, it's demographic realities on the ground. What has happened? The Israelis will say, we've got 500,000 Jewish Israelis that live beyond the 67 lines. Here's a compilation of the population centers you could see them for yourselves. Of course, East Jerusalem being the largest. So with approximately a half a million plus Israelis living beyond those 67 lines, what the Israelis essentially will argue for and bargain for in negotiations, both from a political point of view, but also from a strategic point of view, is our bottom line, if we were on the Israeli negotiation team, is that the vast majority of those Israelis must be included within Israel's new borders if we're ever going to agree to a border with the Palestinians. And I think it's important to point out whether the Prime Minister is of the Likud party, the Kadima party, the Labour party, or any other, moving Jewish Israelis is an extremely difficult thing to do politically. So if I'm the Prime Minister, if you're the Prime Minister, I'm going to want to minimize that problem if and when I ever really get to a close agreement with the Palestinians. So here's the challenge. Can a border between Israel and the future state of Palestine be drawn based on the 1967 lines and include within Israel's new borders the vast majority of Israelis who now live in the West Bank and, the East, Jeru and East Jerusalem. In effect, can we meet the needs of the Palestinian side and the Israeli side and have a solution? How do we do it? And this is where we come to the concept of land swaps. What are land swaps? 
The blue is Israel. The green is Palestine. Here's where we are today, for instance. The green line, of course, is the green line. The blue is an Israeli settlement. And we must employ land swaps because, remember, the Israeli goal, bring the Jews on the internationally recognized side of our borders. So what do we do? We draw the lines a little differently, but remember the Palestinian side, I can't take less than the equivalent of the West Bank in Gaza, so I've got to draw that line a little bit easier in terms of the Israeli side and take in an equivalent amount of pre-67 land. Now, land swaps are an elegant concept. Can you does it really work? How does it work? Or is it just some academic exercise? And what the Israelis will insist, of course, is that any land that's given up doesn't have Jews already living on it, doesn't have vital infrastructure, and the Palestinians will insist, well, it better be the same kind of equivalent land. If I'm giving you really good land, either agricultural or good for housing, I better get the equivalent back. And practically speaking, where are all these 500,000 Israelis? Where do they live? Is it possible to actually take them in? Where are they? And although the vast number of settlements are distributed all throughout the West Bank, and it's complicated, the good news is, if there's good news in this equation, is that the largest concentrations of population actually are relatively adjacent to the 67 lines. And when you add up all of the adjacent communities of Jewish residents, you account for about 375,000 people, 75% 75, 75 of the Jews that live outside of the 67 lines live relatively adjacent to the 67 lines. So if you want to employ land swaps, there's a limited amount of land that you actually could swap and accomplish bringing 75% of those people within the internationally recognized borders of Israel. And most importantly, you're not carving up the West Bank to a point where you are preventing a viable and contiguous Palestinian state, which obviously is of essence to the Palestinians. Here we have some of the realities on the ground in terms of, well, do the Israelis have enough of this land on their side of the 67 lines that is not inhabited, that doesn't have infrastructure that's essential? How much is there? And how much land do we have to take if we're Israelis to get 75% of our Jewish Israelis on our side of the line? We've identified in the red area that we believe would qualify as swappable land. And it amounts to about 4.36 of the land mass of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Now keep that number in mind, 4.36. That's the land available to swap. Now let's look at what the Israelis and the Palestinians have done in the past. If you may recall that Prime Minister Olmert in 2008, in the context of the Annapolis process that President Bush, Bush initiated, he put forth a border proposal that he provided to then President Abbas. Look at those numbers, demographic data. In effect, what Prime Minister Olmert was saying was here, President Abbas, here's my offer. We could end this whole calamity. Give me 85% of the Jews. There'll be 15% that won't be accounted for. We'll have to move them. I'm going to take 5.9% of your land, Mr. Abbas, and I'm going to give you back 5.2%. You might say, whoa, 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 that's not an even swap. Well, the truth is no Israeli leaders ever agreed to a one-to-one -one swap. But what Prime Minister Olmert would probably say if he were seated here, seated here, he'd say, yeah, but you see this little arrow here connecting Gaza and the West Bank? We're going to create a tunnel. We're going to create a bridge. We're going to create a road. We may not give them sovereignty, but it's worth something if we're ever going to connect the West Bank and Gaza. So we're pretty close. 5.9, 5.2. Let's not get too worked up over it. Now, what did the Palestinians... What did President Abbas say? 
What President Abbas said was, um, we need to show the numbers. Remember the numbers from Prime Minister Olmert, 5.9 percent. President Abbas came back and said, you can't get 85 percent of the Jews on your side of the line. You can get 62 percent of the Jews on your side of the line. And I'll give you 1.6 percent of my land, and I'm going to take back 2.0. Don't get focused on the 1.6 or the 2.0. That's min meaningless in the context of everything that's happened in this conflict. But let's just stop here for a moment, if we could, and just digest this. So this conflict has been going on for decades. Thousands of people have died. Countless numbers of lives ruined and affected in the most adverse of ways. World affairs dramatically affected. And when it comes to borders, what it all boils down to is Abbas said you could have 62% of your people and 1.6% of the land. And Olmert said, no, I want 85% of my people and I need 5.9%. So in most negotiation rounds, you can begin to see where the middle ground will end up, or at least the zone of possibility where these two sides can reach. Let's look at some creative solutions that were presented outside of government. Something called the Geneva Initiative in 2003. They called for a 2.2% swap, one to one, and that amounted to 359,000 of the Jewish Israelis on the Israel side of the line. The Baker Institute from St Secretary of State Baker in 2010, they came out with their border proposal. It was a 4.0, 4% swap. They've got 380,000 Israelis, 76% on the Israeli side. And there's a gentleman named David Makovsky who works in Washington at the Washington Institute of Near East Policy. And he had a 3.7% swap but he drew it in a different kind of way and he got 81% of Israelis on the right side and he minimized the amount of inclusion into the West Bank. Let's stop here again for a quick second. Take a good look at this map if you could. And if you recall, when we talked about the proximity of about 375,000 Israelis to the 67 lines, it included in many of the Jewish settlements, but you'll see that arm sticking out, Ariel. That's a big controversial point. And you can see why it's a big controversial point, because the Palestinians, what do they want? They want a contiguous state. They want a state in which the Israelis aren't forever uh, in, in creating an incursion into their contiguity. Ariel, no matter how you cut it, sticks, what, almost between a half and a third into the West Bank, that will be a sticking point. But if you want to include Ariel in, because if you buy into the Israeli position that the fewer Israelis you have to physically remove by the IDF, the more likely an Israeli government will be to agree to it, this is how you could do it. You can argue it either way, of course. So we go to the question, can a border between Israel and the future state of Palestine be drawn based on 67 lines and include within, it, is, within Israel's new borders the vast majority of Israelis who now live in the West Bank and East Jerusalem? That's the question. And in, a, I hope, 15 minutes or less, we have shown you the way in which you might or might not be able to do it. Now that you're experts on borders, let's move <laughs> to security. Here are the Israeli considerations. Security measures must be sufficient to defend Israel's citizens from all major threats, and Lord knows they've got enough of them. Conventional military attack, aerial attack, missiles, terrorism, smuggling, and a whole lot of history that makes them very nervous. Palestinians say, okay, even under the best of days, we get it. However, those security measures must be consistent with the establishment of a sovereign, contiguous, and viable Palestinian state. 
What Saib Arakat and the Palestinian negotiators will say is, we've been living under occupation for so long, I can't sign a deal with the Israelis that keeps the Israeli IDF soldiers in my backyard. My people will never go for it. They'll say it's not a real peace deal. We've just extended the occupation. So yeah, I want to help you secure your state, but you've got to get out of my land, the Palestinians would say. And they would also say is, hey, create a Palestinian state, and it actually becomes a border, a buffer for the state of Israel between you and all your perceived security risks. So the question is, can, can adequate security measures for Israel be implemented that are consistent with the establishment of a sovereign, contiguous, and viable Palestinian state? That's the bottom line question that we have to ask and answer at a negotiation. And in the past, there have been different approaches. There's been the territorial strategic depth approach by the Israelis and others in defining what that security threat is. You see the arrows that's coming from the east, and the Israelis, rightfully so, have been frightened to death from what comes from the east, whether it's Iran, whether it's Iraq. And they've got to be prepared, and from the Israeli perspective, they need a military presence in the Jordan Valley, in the Jerusalem envelope, in the western seam zone, so as to create the kind of dynamic they can defend themselves. The question is, is the territorial approach to security effective? Does it work in terms of providing security? And the answer is, can you do it while also allowing the Palestinians a real state that's contiguous? Now let's just stop here for a second. Take a good look at this map. The green blocks are what is left after, if you take that territorial approach that so many Israelis have taken for many years, and they say, we've got to have a presence on the Jordan Valley, we've got to be surrounding Jerusalem, we've got to have our settlements, we need ways to get back and forth with our military vehicles. Essentially, you're left with Gaza and these three blocks for a Palestinian state. Now, I'm not the Palestinian negotiator, but I'll bet that isn't going to be good enough for him. It's not consistent with a two-state solution. So are we done? Do we just pack up our bags and say security cannot be provided? And then the question at the same time should be raised, okay, let's say we fail. There's no two-state solution. What's the security cost to Israel of not creating a two-state solution? Clearly it emboldens extremists. It certainly under, undermines moderates in the region. It prevents regional cooperation, both militarily, economically, politically, and the like. It fuels the international delegitimization campaign being waged against Israel. And to a certain degree, it alienates Israel's allies. Are there ways that Israel can protect its citizens that will not have the high cost of the territorial approach to security? Can they achieve their security objectives without all of the high cost? That's really the question that we have to help the Israelis, our friends in Israel, figure out. We've listed a number of security measures that are consistent rather than being inconsistent with a two-state solution that would, in fact, at least to a degree, provide a security answer. And I'll put them into four categories. Palestinian restrictions and obligations. We'll go into a deeper oversight, Israeli rights, and unilateral Israeli measures that they can take on their own to provide security. As to... Palestinian restrictions and obligations, what can we do? What can we set up? We can say that the new Palestinian state will be non-militarized, no army. They'll be prohibited from having the army, a limited police force, neutralize their vulnerabilities, and provide a degree of strategic depth. But the principle, principle being that a non-militarized Palestinian state, which President Abbas has agreed to. Palestinian governmental monopoly over the use of weapons and prevent, of course, principally for terror groups from operating at will. They need to be prohibited, the new Palestinian state, I'm sure Israel would require and they would agree from preventing, making alliances with 
stated enemies of the state of Israel. In other words, you make a state of Palestine, you can't go and sign a peace treaty with Iran. Can't sign a peace treaty with Hezbollah. As to things that the Israelis themselves uh, can uh, implement, but also uh, in terms of the border itself, you can have a fortified border fence, of course, numerous surveillance posts, sensor warnings, and remote Israeli cooperation. I think it's important to remember technology, and let's just stop here for a minute. If you think about what can be done with technology, Israelis sitting in Tel Aviv can be watching the Jordan Valley in a way that 20 years ago they needed to be there. We conduct drone operations in the United States all around the world from where? Tampa, Florida. You don't have to be anywhere physically. This helps enormously in terms of not invading upon the sovereignty of the Palestinians, but still providing an enormous security presence if we want it. Palestinians certainly should be required in any peace agreement, most people would agree, to end incitement, to end the delegitimization campaigns against the Jewish state, to try to limit anti-Semitism, anti change textbooks to the degree that they are offensive, TV shows and the like, to the degree possible. What kind of oversight measures can be used to affect this security dynamic? A multinational force made up of European, American, Asian, Muslim forces from all different combinations. They're used today to secure the Egyptian and the Jordanian borders. They can be operated uh, along the border crossings. They can ensure access to Jewish religious sites in the West Bank that are outside of the negotiated border. And they can be used as somewhat of a tripwire against a conventional military attack. They're not going to be the defensive force that you ultimately need, but they will provide some degree of reluctance from the offensive group. Performance-based benchmarks in the process of implementation, very important, and President Obama spoke about this in his May speeches that he gave, uh, meaning that if you in fact did have a negotiation that did in fact amount to something? Does that mean that the next day the Israelis have to give up the keys to everything and remove their security measures? Of course not. You have performance-based benchmarks. Let the Palestinians, the multinational force, whoever's got responsibilities, prove themselves to a degree that satisfy the Israelis so they can in a rational way uh, remove their presence. Uh, and the question will be, from the Palestinian perspective, how long is it? Prime Minister Netanyahu has talked about 40 years. In private, President Abbas has talked about three years or five years. And what is that presence going to mean? Again, you can see the outline, 40 years, three years. Well, diplomats like Ambassador Kurtzer, they could have a field day with benchmarks and put in language and different kinds of things so that you satisfy both the Palestinian need of get the Israelis out of here and the Israeli need of I've got to be watching everything because I don't trust anybody. Israeli rights when it comes to security. What might be agreed upon that's reasonable? Access to airspace. We Americans have no concept of what it's like to protect an airspace when you can fly from Jordan to Jerusalem in two minutes. The Israelis don't have the pleasure or the privilege of just waiting behind their own lines. So there needs to be an agreement of how the Israeli Air Force can patrol. The Palestinians won't have an Air Force. Early warning stations can be deployed in the West Bank, particularly along the Jordan Valley, to give the Israelis some degree of comfort. Secure the West Bank Gaza corridor in a way that the Israelis are comfortable, that the corridor will not be used as either a source of terrorism or a source of conflict. There are many ways to do that that still allow cargo and transit and commerce and normal people-to-people -people relations 
without necessarily compromising Israeli security or sovereignty. The electromagnetic spectrum. I'm not an expert, but it's confusing as can be, and how do you possibly make a division of boundaries between streets and have one governmental entity control it without the other? You have to have joint cooperation between the Israeli and Palestinian authorities to do so, and you also have to make sure from the Israeli perspective that the Palestinians are not able to conduct intelligence that would compromise their security. Israeli-Palestinian security cooperation, we're actually, this is one of the bright spots. For years now, the United States, along with Jordan, has trained more than 5,000. I think it started when Ambassador Kurtzer was there, at least the infancy of it. Trained 5,000 truly professional Palestinian security forces that are for the first time operating in American or Western standards that can be deployed both not only from the Palestinian perspective but the Israeli perspective to uh, buttress up an agreement. Unilateral measures that the Israelis certainly could take to enhance their security. Iron Dome and the missile defense systems growing more technologically savvy and successful literally every day. Working with us, the United States, that will be the largest joint American military, Israeli military Military operation was supposed to be in the next couple of weeks. It's probably going to be towards the end of the year. We'll demonstrate what, in fact, the Israelis will be able to do unilaterally. The Israelis, of course, can put up a security barrier. They've already got it in many places. They can move it to amend it to the new defined boundaries if they wish to. Under an agreement, it can provide certainly a large degree of security not from missiles, but from people. The airport, the Israelis will often tell you uh, the way Ben-Gurion Airport is designed, you can't fly in and out without flying over the West Bank, which exposes civilian air aircraft to all kinds of problems. We, the Israelis, they would say, we have to control it. Well, you can build a north-south runway, which actually can alleviate a good bit of the problem. They're already doing it. The Israelis, of course, have some of the finest defense forces in the world, along with the Mossad and the Shin Bet, and a police set of departments that are some of the finest in the world, and they, of course, would continue to operate at full force. So here's all the threats. We spoke about them quickly. We've rushed through a number of different techniques that can be deployed to either minimize or to controvert any threat. But essentially, we still come back to the basic question, and that is, can adequate security measures for Israel be implemented that are consistent with the establishment of a sovereign, contiguous, and viable Palestinian state. And in many respects, while borders, of course, is an extremely difficult question, the question of security, certainly from the Israeli perspective, is the first question. And they can't even begin, oftentimes, from either a factual or emotional point of view, to engage on the question of borders unless they know they are secure. Oftentimes, Prime Minister Netanyahu will say, you, keep, you Americans keep asking us for a border plan. Well, I can't give you a border plan because I don't know how secure my people are. The more secure I feel, the more I can give you on the border plan. So that's why he argues, let's do security first. And of course, President Abbas argues, all the Israelis want to talk about is security. Security is important, but I need a state, and I need to know I'm going to get a state equivalent to the 67 lines. So, in fact, what President Boss says is, I can give you a little bit more on security if I know I'm going to get a state within the 67 lines. But if I'm not going to get a state within the 67 lines, I can't possibly stand up with my people and say I'm going to let the Israeli defense forces stay on the Jordan Valley. 
So let's talk about them both at the same time, he would argue. And that's where we stop. Gentlemen, let's see if we can unpack some of these ideas. I'm going to kick off the questions, and then I'm going to ask you, the audience, to please join in. We have two microphones here. We're going to give precedence to students who are in the room. Um, and if they are shy, well, uh, we'll help them. Uh, so I'm going to call on students, if you have questions, to be thinking of them and, and come down. I, I want to start in one particular um, place. Um, Robert, and that's the way that you outline the borders where the aerial arm uh, is, you know, with, within a, a new border arrangement. Um, in that framework that you point out of, on the Palestinian side, I need you out of here as fast as you can go. On the Israeli side, I need to know that I'm secure before I can go. That sort of conflict. Does Ariel have area A, B, C, you know, all those uh, security configurations that we have now, do the people of Ariel, Israeli citizens, say, yes, fine, I, it's great to live inside the Palestinian state. Is that a saleable feature for an Israeli prime minister? Um, I think there are many dimensions to this. This is a very important question, and, and it, in, in many ways, illustrates a good bit of the problem. No, I don't think an Israeli prime minister Whoever it is, whether it's Likud, Labor, or anywhere in between, can sleep at night knowing that there are tens of thousands of Jewish Israelis over the border, at least at the beginning, because at any moment you could have a, a massacre or a scenario that literally obliterates any type of agreement that you had. And let us all be honest, even if President Abbas and Prime Minister Netanyahu, for instance, were able to reach an agreement, there will be naysayers on both sides. There will be extremists on both sides that will want to do anything they can to undermine the effort. And what better way to undermine any effort than to create a violent situation for those that may be left behind. But let's just switch gears altogether. The last time I was in Ariel, which was about a little bit less than a year ago, um, you drive in, it's a pleasant enough kind of nothing town, um, and you, you uh, Immediately notice, for instance, though, that the, uh, the big uh, town center, the performing arts center, is named after Reverend Hagee. Um, he donated all the money. But what's most interesting is I went to the, to the swimming pool, the cultural center in Ariel. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning, and not unlike a beautiful condominium in Delray Beach, like Kings Point or Century Village, there was an aquatic class. Um, mostly women, I would say, in their 50s, and probably 150 women doing all kinds of exercises, having the time of their life in the pool in Ariel. Some of them got out of the pool, we spoke to them, many of them, in fact, I think about half of the people that live in Ariel are uh, Russian. And they have not lived in Israel for four decades or four generations. They've lived in Israel a relatively short period of time. Ambassador Kurtz will know this far better than I, but I, I don't want to prejudge anything. But I'll show my bias. I imagine, I'm just using some ingenuity, if you can build an even bigger swimming pool with even a better slide and move it just a little bit closer to the border, maybe with a better aquatic class teacher, those ladies will have an even better life. And I'm making light of a very serious situation. But there are people that live in the West Bank that do so for emotional reasons that will not leave, for religious, whatever it may be, I respect it. They are of, of one category. There are those that went there because they were for, for economic reasons. You can deal with those people with different incentives. And there were others that went there because essentially they were delivered there or their friends were there that came the year before and so forth and they're a group that maybe possibly can be persuaded in another way and i think that's part of the texture of what's going to have to be done ambassador kurtzer when i listen to this description about how you lure people 
out of Ariel, I see dollar signs. Um, and in almost all, every occasion where there has been any agreement um, on, on changing borders, um, it costs money. Um, at a moment when the Obama administration is getting out of Iraq, getting out of Afghanistan, um, at a moment when the United States is in economic peril, um, do you think there is an expectation that the United States will pitch in? And is that possible? Well, there's always been an expectation that the U.S. would bring some off-the-table benefits, uh, cash or other kinds of uh, military assistance or whatever, in order to promote a settlement. And uh, in the past, those have often worked. They, those have been the, the, the uh, last element that's tied together a variety uh, of aspects of a, uh, of a uh, negotiation. And I think one could expect the same here. In the 1990s, when these issues were being negotiated, some very large numbers were being thrown around, uh, anywhere from 35 to $65 billion that would be required, not just for Israeli needs, but also for Palestinian needs in the context of a settlement. Uh, a study would need to be done before um, any of these numbers uh, even uh, were brought to a congressional, uh, to congressional scrutiny. Uh, that would have to look at, number one, whether or not they're real numbers uh, or, or, or uh, are they artificial. But second, what are the uh, alternative costs of not providing those kinds of assistance? In other words, what is the cost to the United States, to the European Union, and others of prolonged conflict? And in uh, most calculations, uh, it probably ends up being sh cheaper in the short term uh, not to pay uh, the requirements of a settlement, but uh, cheaper in the long term to uh, make that kind of investment. But uh, the numbers so far that have been thrown around, I think, have been done unscientifically and therefore not, not real in any, in any uh, way. Let me just follow up uh, one minute on that. There's a lot of argument in, in Washington that, oh boy, you know, the Arab Spring, bad timing. We don't have any money. Uh, and so we won't be able to help out the Libyan government. I'm not sure they need it, but certainly the Egyptians do, and probably Tunis does a bit. Um, but we can't. So that calculation was made that whatever the costs of not doing that are worth uh, not being able to pitch in. This is such a magnitude of cost that you think that there would be a different calculation? Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if the argument uh, for assistance in the Arab Spring has been made uh, seriously enough in Washington. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're, we're in the middle, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, of both a political season and a, a partisan season of politics. And uh, the hardest thing to argue in Washington now is to spend money uh, that then has to be justified back in one's, you know, Boca Raton or some other congressional district. And it's really hard to do. Uh, the question is whether or not there's political leadership in Washington to make the kind of argument that national interest also has a cost. Now, we should not be the only ones expected to bear these costs. Uh, in the past, we often were, and we were ready to do so. But uh, there should be an international coalition that's, uh, that mobilizes resources, both for Arab Spring requirements, but also for a possibility of a peace settlement. Robert Wexler, um, of course, borders and even security can't be disattached from refugees, from all, all of the issues. So there is something a bit missing having this debate, but, but nevertheless, at this moment, when, when you are uh, laying out the, the numbers, uh, it, it, it almost assumes that they're static about how many Israelis live on the other side of the 67 border. What we have seen, uh, even recently, is um, not exactly um, approval for Israelis from illegal settlements staying where they are, um, but sort of a, a tacit kind of approval, which suggests that these numbers aren't static, that unless the borders are agreed to tonight, um, that those numbers are going to continue to grow uh, because there is a force in Israeli politics that says facts on the ground. You put more people out there and it becomes impossible to make this deal. How do you manage to keep that number at least relatively stable? That's a very fair and very important question. From the time we started creating these slides uh, till today, we actually had to go in and amend some of them and change the percentages because things had changed. Um, 
I was at the Herzliya conference, which is a conference in Israel uh, uh, last week, and had the audacity to suggest that Israelis in the context of their next election might want to be mindful about the amount of land that would in theory be available for land swaps should the Israeli government decide on its own, not because of America, not because of Europe, not because of any other actor, but should the Israeli government decide it's in Israel's interest to negotiate and conclude an agreement, I suggested is Israelis might want to be mindful of what's happening and debate it amongst themselves. You would have thought in some quarters I had sided with Ahmadinejad. Um, so these are highly charged questions, but it's even deeper than just the numbers. Quite frankly, it's about trust. And even those Israelis and even those Palestinians, if you ask them a question, would you support a deal on the 67 lines that got 80% of the Israelis in and went through all the criteria, the good news in this story is there's an overwhelming majority of both Israelis and Palestinians that would say, if my government brought this deal to me, I would support it. But that same vast majority that say, yes, I would support it, also say, I don't trust the other side and it will never happen. So figure that out. Dan, this is one of the only conflicts in the Middle East where we know the beginning and we know the end. Um, the problem is we don't know how to get there. Um, has this administration, uh, and we can go backwards, but let's start with this one, missed the boat on messaging. Let's not talk about policy, but even messaging um, to say, you're going to have to deal with this at some moment. So, Let's try to keep things as static as possible. Let's support people who are for limiting settlements. Let's support people who are for moving towards resolving some of these issues. Has the administration missed the boat? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a fair uh, criticism, and uh, it's one that we actually have addressed here on some previous occasions. This uh, administration uh, will always get very high marks for coming into office with the conviction that it could make a difference on the Middle East peace process. You remember on day two, George Mitchell gets appointed. The United States president says that this is a national interest of ours. It's not a favor we're doing for the parties. And it looks like the United States is going to resume what had been a very ambitious role uh, that we had uh, undertaken starting in the early 1990s. And then the, the policy seemed to go a bit astray, uh, more tactical than strategic. There was an effort in addressing the question you raised, Deborah, of uh, uh, trying to achieve a settlements freeze. Well, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, uh, why should I uh, do something that's politically quite uh, challenging for me when there's no payoff? There's no negotiations, there's no reciprocity, there's nothing being asked of the Arab states or the Palestinians. Uh, then the, the administration moved to proximity talks, which was a huge step backwards from uh, 20 years of direct negotiations. There actually were direct negotiations for just a couple of weeks, and then they broke off. And uh, finally, the president, as you remember last May, brought forth this idea of borders and security, the, the very the nature of the proposal that's been discussed today. And it was uh, turned down quite vocally by Prime Minister Netanyahu, but also turned down by the Palestinians who demanded a settlements freeze as a precondition. So you've had an administration that has uh, articulated the idea that it's politically committed, but uh, has seemed to have gotten lost in this very challenging maze of how to make a policy work. Uh, it's not alone. Uh, it uh, inherited this uh, mess from a previous administration, which inherited it from the administration before, and nobody has quite found that mix of uh, resolve, determination, and smarts to put together a uh, peace process that can actually work. I, I happen to think there is a strategy that might work that has to combine both a uh, substantive articulation of American views. I call them Obama parameters, based uh, largely on what uh, we know the parties started to talk about in 2008. Changes in behavior. Palestinians have to do better with respect to violence. Israelis have to do better with respect to settlements. Arab states have to step up and do their part. They uh, came forth with an Arab peace initiative in 2002, but now they're waiting for everybody else to do uh, their things before the Arabs do theirs. And I think it's fair to ask them to step up and uh, 
and contribute their part as well. In other words, a, a peace process that's not one-dimensional but multi-dimensional. I think uh, we have the capability diplomatically and politically to do that, but it's going to require uh, a really a bold leadership. And if I may, mm -hmm. um, just to follow what Ambassador Kircher says, I don't think we actually do know the end of, of this conflict. And the decisions that the Palestinian and Israeli leaders make over the next 18 to 24 months may, in fact, give us a clue as to where it's going to end. But, I mean, today Abbas and, and Hamas signed a so-called unity agreement that appears that it may be more legitimate than ones that they signed in the past. Who knows? We'll learn. But uh, the decisions that the Palestinians make over the next interim period, do they continue a policy of nonviolence? What does Hamas do? Do they accept the three principles of the quartet, nonviolence, accept Israel, accept past agreements? What form do they operate in? Do they continue to go to the UN and other third parties? Do they continue to fuel a delegitimization of Israel campaign? Or do they negotiate? Those are questions for the Palestinians. On the Israeli side, they have some very fundamental questions they're going to have to answer. Uh, do they wish to remain a Jewish state? Do they wish to remain a, de a democratic state? And if they want to remain Jewish and democratic, what are you going to do with the five million non-Israelis who live between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River? And Israelis are going to have to begin to answer those questions and not simply brush them under the rug. And how they answer them will largely determine, I think, the resolution of this conflict. This is my last question. So students, start your engines. Not yet. Um, <laughs> but I'm so glad you're there. Um, I want to ask both of you, and I'll start with Robert. Um, we probably are in one of the most challenging times in the Middle East, certainly in my reporting career. Um, I have been in embassies where American diplomats sort of say, are you sure we support democracy in the Middle East? Uh, it is really a chaotic time, and in some ways, we don't know how it's all going to turn out. Uh, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, and out of 22 Arab states, only four have been through their, their revolutions. So the question is, these are revolutions that didn't start out about Palestine, but you know that it will come back to that question, because it is a fundamental question in the Middle East. What is the price if there isn't a peace process? Well, I think it's, it's very important to underline what you said, which is the, the, the Arab Spring is not about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and it's important to highlight that the ills in the Arab world are not caused by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's also, I think, important to highlight that it is largely naive to think that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will remain divorced from the chaotic events that surround Israel and the Palestinian territories. And I think President Shimon Peres said it best. He was in uh, Washington several months ago and he was asked this question, far more important than me being asked the question. And he said that when, for instance, the Egyptians go and vote, and when parliaments in the Arab world begin to act, he wants them to act on domestic issues. He wants them to be focused on the needs of their people and the needs of their country. He doesn't want them focusing on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And his view was, if they have the privilege or luxury to focus on their own countries, then both the Israelis and the Palestinians will be far better off for it. Having said that, though, that's wishful thinking, it appears. And so the question is, what will happen in this context that might actually bolster up the confidence of both the Israelis and the Palestinians to act in a more bold fashion? And I would argue, uh, not today, but in the interim weeks and maybe months, what is unfolding in Syria may in fact be that opportunity um, in a totally uncoordinated way, but Hezbollah, Hamas, certainly Hamas has had to leave Damascus. They've lost their suitor, suitor in Syria. Hezbollah is about to uh, completely have its uh, support broken from Syria if Assad goes down. Iran is about to be delivered an enormous blow that we could have never dreamed to deliver. 
Uh, and it may, I would argue, under the best of circumstances, allow, even though the Turks and the Israelis are much divided today, to act in a concerted fashion with the United States, with Saudi Arabia, with the moderate Gulf states, to begin to actually minimize the effect of the access of evil of, in this case, Hezbollah, Syria, and Iran. That's the wishful uh, part of this story that would enable Israel and enable the Palestinians possibly some breathing space and confidence to do some things. But there's a whole other equation that I could just as easily go through that would have a different result. Uh, yes, and tomorrow we'll find out more about right. if, how wishful that is. Let me add one point. I, I agree with Robert at the strategic level, but let me take it down to what might be called the street level. We, we have known, um, and you know, as we've mentioned here a few times, WikiLeaks now gives us a window into what our diplomats have known. Uh, and our diplomats have also known that uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict resonates within Arab public opinion uh, and has resonated within Arab public opinion in very strong ways over the years uh, to such a degree that many governments have had to, uh, in a sense, forcibly tamp down the degree to which their own publics would have wanted them to become more energized and animated over this issue. Now that those governments are no longer able to, uh, or some of those governments are no longer able to keep that lid on, the emotional side of this conflict uh, is going to play an increasingly important role in the period ahead. We saw the way in Egypt, for example, in September, how uh, the attack on the Israeli embassy, the 12 attacks now on the Israeli, on the Egyptian pipeline carrying gas to Israel, uh, does represent an expression of very significant popular anger, which is now more free to express itself than it was previously. Robert is exactly right that the Arab-Israeli conflict is not the cause of the problems that has prompted, that have prompted the uh, Arab awakening or uprising to start. But without a resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict, you have this unfinished, very emotionally laden business that's going to weigh heavily in the calculation of Arab masses. And whoever rules, whether it's in a post-Assad Syria or in a post-Mubarak Egypt, is going to have to uh, figure out a way to deal with this. One of the reasons that some of us argue that even in the context of this Arab Spring, there should be a more active peace process is to start to take this issue off the agenda of Arab public opinion and to see if we can't be moving on it while they do deal with their domestic uh, social economic issues. Thank you both. And now I am going to open up to questions from the audience. I'm so sorry I've been turned this way. We should have done this a little bit better. But let's start with you. And can you say your name, please? Um, I'm Bahul Subramanian. Um, my, thank you very much. for. I, en I enjoyed both of your presentations. Oh. Um, stand very close. Um, my name is Rahul Subramanian. Um, I, thank you very much for your presentations. I really enjoyed both of them. My question centers around the whole issue of East Jerusalem. So, um, so the Palestinians have articulated the idea that East Jerusalem should be the capital of, a new, of the new Palestinian state. How might this desire complicate the issue of the, of the drawing up of the borders for the new state, as you mentioned in your um, earlier map? Uh, here's an advertisement for March the 5th. In this room at 4.30, uh, we will have a presentation on Jerusalem and refugees as the second set of issues that motivate the two sides. It's a, it's a very complicated set of issues, but I think in the same way that uh, Congressman Wexler suggested that by understanding the positions of the two parties, one can pose this, these questions in a manner that uh, might offer solutions, you might find the same thing with respect to Jerusalem. So hold that question for a month. <laughs> Congressman, do you have anything you want to add? No, well right. said. Second question. By the way, is it March 5th or March 6th? Paper says March 6th. March 5th. March 6th. No, it was moved. <laughs> I, th I think it was moved to March 6th on Dan's request, <laughs> which is why I don't know when it is. It's March 6th. It's the month, it's the Tuesday. Tuesday, March 6th. Tuesday. Oh boy. We'll send out a notice to the crowd I can't do it. Am I right? It's March 6th? Let's take you up first and then we'll go to you. Me? Him first. Him first. 
When it, when it dies down. That's one of those days. And say your name, please. Uh, my name is Marion Messing. I'm a first year master in public affairs student at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, my question concerns uh, one of the questions that was that Ms. Amos uh, posed about the Obama administration's rather tepid response to Israeli settlement expansion. And I asked this question in the context of having visited Hebron six days ago and uh, having seen some of the injustices. Um, I, I asked this question in, in the context of having visited Hebron six days ago and having seen some of the injustices that um, are incidental to the Israeli occupation. These injustices were also described in, by Jonathan Friedland in an article in the most uh, recent ber uh, um, version of the New York Review of Books. Um, U.S. opposition to settlement expansion is not new. 21 years ago, when Israel planned to expand settlements, George H.W. Bush uh, froze credit to Israel, credit that was going to be given at uh, low interest rates. 18 years later, when Vice President Biden visited Israel, um, the interior minister sort of slapped him in the face by announcing settlement expansion in East Jerusalem. So my question is, what's changed over the past 20 years? Ambassador Kurtzer, um, during your introduction, you um, mentioned some factors that might explain this in increasing polarization in the United States, um, diminishing U.S. power, and then also the development of what might be called the Washington Consensus. Um, Aaron David Miller, in an article in Foreign Policy two years ago, <laughs> right, mentioned that the United States has lost its ability to talk tough with its close friend. What has happened over the past 20 years that a Republican president 20 years ago could talk tough with its close friend, but a Democratic president 20 years later is no longer able, able to. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a timely question, but respectfully, I, I would differ with much of the predicate. Um, and I say that from, from the perspective, I, I support this administration's policy in terms of its uh, opposition to uh, the, the policy of settlements. However, uh, like all other issues, settlements are but one part of this equation. Very aptly, you asked, well, what's changed in the last 20 years? Well, a few things come to my mind. Uh, we had an intifada that was remarkably more dangerous and destructive than, than anything that had ever occurred. And the Israeli people uh, every week watched tens of people being blown to smithereens. We, we've had the advent of Hamas, which after Prime Minister Sharon unilaterally left Gaza in the hope, after evacuating 8,000 plus Israeli settlers, that the Palestinians might react responsibly. In fairness, the Israelis were greeted with a barrage of thousands of rockets to then uh, require Prime Minister Olmert to respond with cast lead and a tremendous military uh, operation. We've had the advent of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, depending on estimates, as much as over 40,000 missiles becoming more and more technologically uh, uh, skillful literally every week that now threaten Israel. We have the, of course, potential nuclear threat of Iran. Now, what does all of this have to do with the circumstances in Hebron that you saw that you rightfully find objective or an objection to? Well, nothing directly, possibly, but you asked the question, well, why can't the President of the United States, like with, with lightning zero vision, focus in on settlements? Because the President of the United States has to consider settlements like he has to consider the intifada, like he has to consider security, like he has to consider all of the other factors that are involved in this equation. And when you consider all of the other factors, I think where objective parties fall is that nothing is black and white, it is gray, and that the past historical experience is that we as a nation will not be effective ordinarily in moving our Israeli friends to a position that we are more comfortable with by applying negative incentives, 
but rather positive incentives tend to get a be better return. Now, others could take exception with that, but that would be, the, I think, the response to your question. And again, this needs to be put in the context of the world when you're dealing with Iran and you're dealing with actors that are quite dangerous. The notion of engaging a very strong ally in a punitive way sends a very troubling message to the world and to other actors in the region that could have very unintended consequences that don't do us or the Israelis any good. Yeah. Since uh, Robert and I disagreed on the dates of the next presentation, we'll also disagree a little bit on this uh, more substantive question. Look, the administration uh, uh, started out with the idea of uh, adopting a settlements freeze, uh, largely in reaction to the atmosphere that it inherited when it came into office. You remember a day or two before the inauguration of President Obama, the uh, Gaza war came to an end, a very brutal uh, uh, fighting between uh, Israel and Hamas. And the administration believed, uh, because of that, that there was a need for something to improve the atmosphere uh, in order to create circumstances that would be more conducive to negotiations. And it tried um, working with Arab states, with the Palestinian Authority, and with Israel on a so-called confidence-building measure for each that would have some meaning for the other. Settlements became the biggest of those confidence-building measures, uh, and it didn't get the answer that it wanted from Israel, but it also didn't get the answer it wanted from Arab states or from the Palestinians as well. The Arab states would not take steps towards so-called normalization uh, before there were uh, signs of progress in negotiations, and uh, the Palestinians uh, would not, uh, I don't know exactly what the administration asked the Palestinians to do, but the answer I do know came back negative. Whatever it was, the answer was no. So the administration was left with one big issue hanging out there, and that then seized everyone's attention because it has been on the agenda of the United States for many years. One could then make the argument that the administration uh, fumbled the ball, uh, having put that issue out there. Because if you're going to demand a complete settlements freeze, including natural growth, which is what uh, Secretary of State Clinton uh, indicated in May of 2009, then you better be ready to back that up with something. And we weren't. And when we weren't ready to back it up and we're ready to accept something far less than a complete freeze with natural growth, it was hard to accept the administration's argument that it was an unprecedented positive move. It just sounded hollow at that point. So one could argue very significantly with the tactics of the administration, but I think one needs to understand the initial motivation was to try to create an atmosphere not in and of itself uh, important, but an atmosphere that would then uh, pave the way for negotiations. And that uh, did not succeed at all. Oh, hi, Adam Bierman, Princeton Cable TV. Um, do you think there's any credibility, credibility that um, Israel will try to destroy Iranian nuclear um, and can, um, uh, missile, no, excuse me. Um, and two, if that was to happen, uh, what would that do to the uh, Mid Middle East peace process? Not quite a border question. <laughs> Look, uh, we, we all know as much as we all know, and what it is is what we're reading in the newspapers. There's a significant debate in Israel on the question of whether uh, in the absence of uh, any other um, form of pressure or inducement to stop the Iranian program, whether military options should be exercised. And we've heard American policymakers uh, uh, make arguments on both sides of this equation as well. Uh, no one knows the answer except the decision makers who have to make that decision. And I'm not even sure that they know the answer yet. Uh, we are in a period of very intense uh, uh, chess that's being played out on this international uh, strategic board. A uh, combination of uh, holding out the prospect of some diplomatic engagement, which has not yet proved successful, uh, trying to uh, make the sanctions bite so that the Iranians have a reason to try to get out from under some problems, uh, perhaps even offering some inducements uh, should uh, they decide to uh, suspend the program. But uh, there's no simple answer to that question. Certainly, there's a connection between what happens in the Gulf and what happens in the Levant. So uh, 
uh, both uh, people in the Gulf and in the Levant are watching carefully to see how this uh, unfolds. The, the problem is that the Persians invented the game of chess. Um, and they, they have arguably played the game, at least up until the last several weeks, more effectively than we may have. And while, as Ambassador Kurtzer rightfully points out, we, we all read what the discussion is in Israel, but if you boil down the Israeli policy and the American policy with respect to Iran, although there's entirely different theater, the policy is actually quite comparable. And that is to support at this point the implementation of the severest economic and political sanctions possible in the hope, not the expectation, but in the hope that such a scenario will provide incentive for rational and saner minds in Iran if they exist to take different decisions that will enable meaningful negotiations to thwart the ultimate realization of their nuclear weapon program. At the same time, both the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Israel have allowed military options to remain on the table. Now again, the theater has been different, but the policy is actually the same, and you could argue, uh, not irrationally, that the Israelis have a role to play here. We may not always agree with it, but the Israelis have a role to play, and the United States has a role to play, and they're different. And the Israelis may perceive that, given their vulnerability, that their role is to provide the energy when the United States and our European allies from the Israeli perspective may be slowing down a bit, and that also to a degree gives the United States the ability to argue to our European friends and others that if they don't take certain steps, that in effect they will be encouraging the result that they fear the most, which is an Israeli strike. So I think you have to read beneath the second, third, and fourth layers. Thank you. I'm going to stay on the side of the room. Be back there in a minute. Uh, state your name. Um, I'm AJ. I'm a junior in the history department. So a lot of the slides talked about issues that both. Uh, make sure you just pull, push that microphone up a little bit. Does that is that better? That's great. Great. All right. So I'm AJ. I'm a junior in the history department. Um, the slides, oftentimes, that you had showed um, kind of issues that both sides rationally have to worry about, and it made sense. But we've also talked about how um, both sides are very emotionally charged in this, and that leads to kind of irrational factors as well. So do you, either of you see any strategies for kind of calming down the emotions to allow a, a debate to actually be productive? Uh, it was an article in the, uh, I think, of the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago by Dennis Ross, who was in the administration for the first three years, that suggested that there would be room uh, today for uh, ground-up activities that might uh, encourage the Palestinians, for example, to continue the economic development programs that they had started and have actually proceeded somewhat successfully, as well as to continue the uh, security enhancements uh, including the training of their security forces, uh, but also calling on Israel then to lighten up with respect to restrictions on mobility, maybe even settlement activity and so forth. Uh, there are ideas out there to improve the atmosphere uh, and try to create conditions, but uh, we, we've seen in the past that any such activities that are divorced from a, a negotiating situation in which the two sides can see something of what the horizon looks like, uh, those are largely bound to fail because they, they run out of steam. And the best situation is when you have some improvement on the ground in which people can benefit, see their lives getting better, but then the two governments uh, start uh, engaging and they use that improvement on the ground as a political catalyst to get together. The problem over the next months is that one could envisage ground up improvements, but it's hard to see where the catalyst is going to come for the government to government talks. We had an effort by the King of Jordan to, uh, to do so. I think there were five rounds of negotiations, but uh, it looks like it's gonna be difficult to keep them going. If you can keep them going, then you might find a good marriage between the ground up and the, the top down approach. 
The, the only thing I would add, your, your question is excellent and Ambassador Kurtz's response is complete. The, the only thing I would add is that ultimately, after the ground up measures are employed, hopefully with some degree of success, what is required is still an extraordinary degree of political leadership by men or women uh, that are beyond reasonable in terms of their bravery and what might be expected of them. We need a Sadat moment. We need a Yitzhak Rabin who are willing to go beyond their life experience and, and almost act in a, in a uh, counterintuitive way to bring their society to a place it isn't at today. And it certainly would appear on both the Israeli and the Palestinian side that such a leader either doesn't exist at this moment or isn't empowered to act. I just want to mention, you're not wearing a Boston shirt because you rooted for the Patriots, are you? No, no, no. This is Giants country here. That's another border issue. <laughs> My question is, when you made reference in your discussions earlier to various agreements on international discussions, you did not make any reference that I heard, and perhaps I wasn't listening carefully enough, to the Oslo Accords. Is there some reason why you did not mention that? Thank you. No, there was no reason. Um, no, the, the Oslo didn't specify territorial uh, uh, numbers. I think what the congressman's presentation was focused on were those points in history where there were uh, territorial uh, dimensions to the to the conflict resolution process. So Oslo was part and parcel of the peace process, but it did not end up producing a, any kind of a um, stage in the development of this territorial, uh, the resolution of the territorial issue. I have a very quick question. Okay. <laughs> Stephen Levine, I would like to hear the reaction of these two gentlemen. If Prime Minister Netanyahu were to say that he was in favor of any one of those land swap charts that you showed to us before, I believe that five minutes after he said that, he'd get a vote of no confidence for the, from the Israeli parliament. What's your reaction to that? It if Prime Minister Netanyahu were to do what you said in a vacuum, I have no doubt that you are correct. And I don't think Prime Minister Netanyahu would ever do that for that reason, even if, I mean, for a lot of reasons. But, but the only way I could envision a, pres a Prime Minister Netanyahu coming to anything close to that type of conclusion would be if it were done within the context of a very significant, comprehensive agreement that provided to Prime Minister Netanyahu and to the Israeli people an enormous number of prizes, not the least of which was a new relationship with Saudi Arabia, with the Arab world, the implementation of the Arab Peace Initiative, as, as Ambassador Kurtzer defined. There would have to be a whole series of events and, and compounding actions that would reluctantly allow a Prime Minister Netanyahu, or for that matter, in fairness, a Kadima Prime Minister or a Labor Prime Minister. They're gonna have to have the same type of influences that allow them as well. And we haven't even talked about Jerusalem yet, which starts a whole nother discussion. I, I'd, only, I'd only add one thing, if I might. Please? Um, and I, I would leave it for you to chew on. Every Prime Minister in Israeli political history who has started out on a peace process has uh, faced a cost in domestic political terms. Every prime minister who has ended with an agreement has had that agreement supported by a majority of the Knesset. So it's hard to get into this process, particularly in a coalition, for example, that the prime minister faces today, but that's the measure of leadership. If you can see it through, the Israeli people will support the agreement. I'd like to thank both gentlemen. Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer, the Honorable Robert Wexler, and for those of you who want to know if Middle East peace is possible, see them next month. Thank you, Deborah.